So we have absorption, transmission, scattering, and reflection. Uh, so there are four types of tissue interaction with the laser. Absorption is when the chromophores, okay, remember chromo means color, absorb the photons and the energy is converted to complete the work. You have transmission, which is when the laser energy passes through the superficial tissues to heal the deeper areas. Scattering, which is not the most useful tissue interaction because the laser hits the target and then scatters in various directions. And uh, there's not much control over the laser, just like with radiation. And lastly is reflection. And the laser beam bounces off the surface without penetrating. So for the dental hygienist, uh, this is not useful. And it's uh, great to trim tissue, though, around titanium implants uh, to place the abutment. Now you ask, what is an abutment? You haven't had that yet. Uh, when is the abutment placed? Uh, how is the excess tissue removed from the abutment in the traditional manner, well, the lasers can replace the blade. So before you get started, uh, you need to know about the safety. Optical density is how uh, well protected our eyes are from the light while wearing safety glasses. Um, have you ever bought a pair of sunglasses without UV protection? They usually look great, but they don't give you a lot of eye protection. So you need to make sure that the eye protection that you're wearing will protect your eyes from laser damage. So, oh, excuse me. I don't know where that came from. Okay. So here are some different types of laser glasses. Some of them are supposed to be funny, but the nightclub style is used to protect the DJ or the club workers from the laser light shows, okay? Uh, and the one on the right is more of what you'll find in dental offices. They come in different colors from green to, to red. And the important thing is to make sure that the safety glasses are manufactured for the laser type that you are using. If you're using a diode laser, then those might require different safety glasses than an ND YAG laser, for example. And the other thing you need to do, okay, after eye protection is make sure that you have the proper signage. So a safety sign is going to be placed near the laser treatment to avoid scattered exposure of the laser in other people's eyes, right? So it's placed in the clinical area. It's just letting everybody know that a laser is going to be used. So don't look at the light. So who wears the safety glasses? Hmm. So it's going to be both the patient and the clinician. Both need eye protection as well as your instructor because you will be doing uh, lasers. Uh, whenever you do laser in clinic, you'll be having a skill evaluation performed and an instructor will be watching you. So you need three sets of safety glasses. What are some of the uses in dentistry? Uh, the list on the gray side is the uh, dentistry in general, and the right side is for dental hygiene related uses. So you have to check whatever state you're working in to uh, check the Practice Act to see if number one, you are allowed to use lasers, what is the uh, educational requirement for that particular state, as well as what are the parameters of the scope of practice. So when you graduate from dental hygiene school in Virginia, you will be able to use a laser anywhere in Virginia. Okay, we are um, abiding by the Board of Dentistry rules and regulations. So look at the difference between the sizes. Uh, sides. The laser on the, the left-hand side for the dentist to use is assisted in caries, diagnostic management, restorative dentistry, oral diagnosis, and oral medicine, again, for diagnostic purposes. In periodontics, they are cutting tissue, endodontics, as well as biostimulation, 
for bone growth and other things. Now for dental hygiene, we can use a laser for cervical root desensitization, herpetic uh, lesions, aphthous ulcers, laser bacterial reduction, and that's what we're using mainly the lasers for is the laser bacterial reduction. Laser curatage, uh, which we aren't doing uh, in the state of Virginia, as well as tooth whitening and pain therapy. So the diagnodent, sometimes the dental assistant will use this, sometimes the dental hygienist will use it, but the dentist is the one who makes the diagnosis. Uh, there are a number of different laser lights out there for diagnostic purposes, for caries detection, Diagnodent is a name brand. This is a laser-assisted caries diagnosis and management system. And what's meant uh, by laser-assisted caries diagnosis is that it helps diagnose caries. Uh, and how about the management part? Well, it helps determine if the decay is early decay and can be remineralized or is it turning into full decay? So the nice thing about these laser assisted diagnostic tools for caries uh, diagnosis is you can get an incipient lesion and remineralize it. And uh, it never turns in to a um, cavity that needs restoring if you catch it early enough. For restorative, uh, the laser uses um, uh, different types of lasers because you're cutting tooth, you're cutting tissue, um, but less of the natural tooth usually needs to be removed as compared to using the traditional drill. So uh, let's take a look at the incisal composites on uh, this one picture in this right hand side. That was using a uh, ur yag laser, a different type of cutting laser. So it preserves tooth structure as well. So on uh, dentalcare.com, everybody's done the, um, the CE course by now, and that also shows the diagnodent um, is used to determine the depth of decay. The study states uh, that was presented uh, states that the final preparations were done without anesthesia if you're using a laser to do the cutting. Uh, what do you think about that? Could this be done really without anesthesia? Uh, would you do it without a laser, without anesthesia? So the true question is, how long will the composite last? And if the prep is not done deep enough, will the composite even stay on? So uh, there's still a lot of ongoing studies that are uh, being done with the usefulness and longevity of lasers to cut tooth structure. And a study done by uh, Romeo states that laser causes slight damage to soft tissue when uh, the soft tissue is removed. The lesion being removed will need to be large enough to clear the burned edges, plus the type of laser used uh, will need to be identified for the pathologist to determine if the laser damage uh, is what they're seeing versus tissue damage. So for the oral uh, medicine, you need to be very thorough in your notes, especially if you're biopsying and sending things off. So according to this one study, there was less bleeding, and this prevents the spread um, of cancer cells potentially, as well as helps in the patient healing. But it also means less anesthesia. But why wouldn't a doctor use it for uh, cutting tissue? Well, it's very technique sensitive and it's hard to really get clean cuts, unlike a scalpel. So if you're uh, not used to the technology and there's any loss of control over technique, it can be quite a sloppy um, procedure. And when cancer is identified by the pathologist, uh, where is the patient sent? The patient's usually sent to a larger hospital or cancer treatment area. So a lot of these biopsies are being done in hospital where treatment can be, um, can be followed up on. You can remove fibromas. This is using an ERG-YAG laser, okay? A topical anesthetic is used. There weren't any sutures because it cauterizes. And the final picture was six months post-op, no scarring. Pretty impressive, huh?
So for periodontics, this is a crown lengthening or gingivectomy case where uh, it had a gummy smile. You can see on the uh, right hand side that was the same day. Now all of these crowns are going to be redone. The tooth is going to be longer and it will aesthetically be a much more pleasing smile. Those look like very old acrylic style crowns as well. Not pretty. So same patient one week later and then cementation. And the, um, there's a little bit of interdental bleeding there, but that will heal up. So for periodontics, here's the same, uh, the same tissue uh, that has too much gum covering the crowns of the teeth. So it looks like it might be orthodontic related. No crowns are in this image, uh, but you can see the traditional way of fixing the tissue here, especially on the mandibular arch. But look at all those white spot lesions as well. Some gingivectomy, gingiplasty being done. So the tissue is cut using a sharp instrument and a blade is cut, uh, the, is making the markings. A flap is made and it's, uh, the removal of bone is done with a burr. and then sutures are placed. So at this point, the tissue um, has not started to heal. Uh, so there's really uh, no swelling present. Um, this is how the tissue lays as the end product. All right, so you can see that it's sutured, it's sutured down tight. This is uh, the type of surgery that we as hygienists don't oftentimes get to participate in. 16 weeks after the veneers are placed and look at the before versus the after. Phrenectomy. Uh, Dentalcare.com labels the phrenectomy as part of uh, periodontics, but uh, with the laser use, uh, this may become part of a general dentist item because a lot of dentists, general dentists, have lasers now in their practice. The first image, you can see that there, uh, there is a phrenum pull. The laser is used to cut the, the pull. Uh, no sutures are needed. Six months post-op, this was using an Ur-YAG uh, laser, which dental hygienists are not allowed to use, but notice how much of the attached gingiva has grown versus the first picture. So endodontics uh, was discussed to remove the diseased um, necrotic nerve, okay? Um, this is uh, used to remove the nerve. The files are traditionally used to remove nerves and the canals can become calcified or curved, which makes the accessing of those canals very difficult. So a laser can be used to break down that calcification and the laser can also be used to scan for accessory canals. So if accessory canals are not detected, then, and the tooth is sealed, that is usually indicative of a future root canal failure. So biostimulation is a term uh, that you should be familiar with, and that is changing the environment with bacteria. So similar to adding probiotics to the digestive system to add better bacteria to the gut, this stimulates the existing bacteria that the body needs and it reproduces the good bacteria. So the benefit to this is that it uses the bacteria that's already present as opposed to giving the patient antibiotics that wipes the body out of all bacteria.
So how do you decide between biostimulation and bioremediation versus total bacterial wipeout? Maybe how involved the perio and the bacteria is. So we want to change the environment. So we want to stimulate the existing bacteria. This is the diode laser. Now, this is where we come in. You're going to see a lot of different lasers for dental hygiene use. Uh, we can use it for cervical root desensitization as well. But what is the traditional way of desensitizing a root surface? You may also see this for herpetic lesions, aptus ulcers, laser bacterial reduction, and um, laser curatage, as well as whitening and pain procedures. So let's talk about root desensitization. Okay, why does cervical root desensitization work? Remember that hydrodynamic theory that tells us that the fluid in the tubules can move toward and away the pulp, away from the pulp. The more it moves, the more sensitivity is felt. So the laser dehydrates those tubules, so the volume of the fluid is decreased. And because there's less volume of fluid, there's going to be less movement and it becomes more viscous and it moves much less within the tubules. And that is why there's desensitization happening. And that relief can last up to 12 months. What kind of uh, metal object could be in the mouth? You want to be careful when you're using uh, lasers, you're going to do a screening first. You don't want to use the laser around, in a, uh, around metal. Uh, braces, crowns, piercings, okay, because the metal can conduct heat from the laser. You don't need to anesthetize, which is great, and um, you're not even touching the root surface. You're using the light waves. So you use an uninitiated tip, and we're going to get into that in a couple of minutes, at 1.5 watts for 30 seconds, okay, on a, uh, on a pulse. All right, 50% duty. So it's on half the time and off half the time. So it's buzz off, buzz off, buzz off, very rapidly like that. It's not a continuous pulse. But you start five millimeters away from the root surface, bathing the area with the tip. You're just kind of floating that light around. And you use slow, small, circular motions, keeping the tip moving as you move closer and closer to the root surface. And then if the patient starts feeling some discomfort, you back off a little bit from that five millimeters and you start going towards the uh, surface again, and you treat the root surface for about 90 seconds. And if it's still sensitive, you wanna increase the wattage from 1.5 to 1.8, right? So you've got some flexibility when it comes to that, but you're using light to desensitize the root surface. How does it work with um, herpetic lesions and aphthous ulcers? The laser energy actually kills the surface virus and um, it's uh, by killing the virus, it is killing what's activating the lesion. So the active process is stopped and the lesion retracts and heals. The nerve endings are cauterized by that light energy. So the symptoms stop as well. So healing time is decreased because of the, um, the low laser therapy, low laser light therapy. Okay, photo biomodulism, uh, modulation is what it's really called, but it's the healing time is decreased and it's a lovely thing. Now with this, you have to be careful of what we call the plume, right? If you give, if it's hitting tissue, if the light's hitting tissue and it gives off um, some sort of invisible aerosol, that is the plume, and that can get into uh, the patient's nose, the patient's eyes, your eyes, and other areas, and can inoculate a, another area. The nice thing with the herpetic lesion, though, is that um, it's very effective. You don't anesthetize. You need to use a high-volume 
suction. Okay, it's recommended to use that whenever you're using a laser. Uh, now we have the wonderful equipment, the, the PureVax, to do that with, but you want to prevent further exposure to any of the bacteria. So you use an uninitiated tip at 1.5 watts for, again, 30 seconds at 50% pulsing, and you just paint the entire area. Um, or in the prodromal case, before the uh, outbreak occurs, you're covering about five to six millimeter diameter. Um, cycle and you spend as much as 90 seconds as or as close as possible to that to the lesion and if pain still persists you can increase to 1.8 like we said earlier. For aptus ulcers this is really wonderful for patients that have aptus ulcer and the technique is exactly the same as the herpetic lesion. Now with herpes the um, idea is it will take care of that herpetic lesion and that lesion will never come back in that area. But remember, you've got that ganglia that has that, um, that virus in it. So it will find another avenue. If it liked the lower lip and that's the one that you, uh, you treated, it might go to the upper lip or, or someplace else. It will find another area to come out on. So aptus ulcers, it's great for that as well. Um, that takes the pain away, increases the healing. All right, we're using it as laser bacterial reduction. Why does it work? The diode lasers are antibacterial. It's the light and the heat. It only takes a few minutes to complete uh, the full run of the mouth. All right, uh, we are using it in clinic for more site specifics, but periodontal offices are decontaminating the entire mouth with it. Um, the periodontal pathogens are pigmented. Remember the gram positive, gram negative, okay? They, they absorb light in different ways. And in the presence of disease, all of them are susceptible to the absorption of the diode wavelength. Uh, it doesn't rely on patient compliance. They're in the chair, they've got their mouth open, and you're just bringing that light subgingibly and waving the light right around that subgingival pocket area. It helps reduce and eliminate cross contamination as well from bacteria from one site to the other. And it can be done prior to probing to minimize the potential inoculation of the mouth with periopathogens. Now what that is saying is you use it prior to probing, you're decontaminated um, the pocket areas, and then you put the probe in where you're going from one tooth to the next. So you're not uh, inoculating one pocket with the pathogens from another. So they, um, for the laser bacterial reduction, you're using um, certain tips and uh, they've got straight tips and curved tips and, and everything that we'll be getting into. Uh, some of them um, are thicker than others. You want to use what's called an uninitiated tip. That means it's not meant for cutting and you choose the perio pocket setting. So um, you there's, there are gauges on there. You want to choose about a 1.5, one and a half watts. You're going to use a pulsing or intermittent setting. And this will all make sense when you get into uh, the lab setting. And you aim the tip into the sulcus, but you don't enter the sulcus. Or if you do, uh, this is saying you only need to go about a half a millimeter into the sulcus. So what that's saying is the light that's being emitted, think about a flashlight going into a dark area. That light is going to shine beyond where the flashlight is. And if the light is hitting that area, then that's the area that is going to be decontaminated. So unlike the ultrasonic scaler and your curettes that actually have to touch every millimeter of surface, that's not the case with the laser. You wanna go in and you want to flash that light, so to speak, all around and have it just go smoothly up and down and around the entire sulcus 
pocket area to decontaminate it. If the tip self-initiates, now you're using an uninitiated tip, if the tip self-initiates, that means the tissue starts to stick to the end. You're seeing smoke, okay? It's actually, um, actually cutting tissue. You want to wipe the tip with a two by two wet gauze, and then you can continue. If the tissue is heavily pigmented, now remember, laser lights are attracted to pigments. So if the tissue is heavily pigmented, then you need to turn the machine wattage down just a little bit as well. So when do you use it? Some use it at every recare appointment. It's the first thing they do before they even pick up a probe. They're going in and they're decontaminating. It does reduce the risk of spreading periopathogens throughout the mouth during the examination. But laser bacterial reduction can be performed even in a healthy mouth. And that was one of the last laser courses I took was recommending it in healthy mouths before periodontal breakdown occurs or with existing periodontal patient, even if they're stable, to use as an adjunct, right? Again, uh, it's just trying to keep the bacterial load down. After laser bacterial reduction, it's been shown that it can take four to six weeks of, uh, back before the bacteria can recolonize to the point of uh, where it was prior to that treatment, four to six weeks. Uh, the justification is to kill bacteria before the patient experiences any loss of attachment. So you want to do this frequently, just like your perio maintenance, and you want to get in there before any damage can occur. But when uh, presented properly, laser bacterial reduction gives the patient more opportunities to experience laser dentistry's clinical benefits. And that's another reason to promote your treatment planning. So dentists who have these machines love hygienists to promote their um, to, to promote their technology uh, by educating the patient and what they can have at their disposal, and then it's up to the patient whether or not they would uh, like to take advantage of it. So. For the decontamination, you've got this uh, fiber and you're going to extend it from the machine. You strip the fibers because it's got a little um, glass, it's, it's a glass fiber and it's got a plastic covering on it. So you want to strip that plastic covering off and that's called stripping. And you get about a five to 10 millimeter uh, section of it, just like a periodontal probe. And um, you set up the machine to one to one and a half watts, depending, it can go up to 1.8 watts. But the lower the setting for less severe periodontal disease, and the higher the setting for more advanced disease. And again, the lower the setting for highly pigmented tissue as well. There's a ready button, just like with a um, x ray machine. It's turned on, but it's not ready. So you turn the ready button on. Uh, you test it with a, a wet uh, two by two gauze, and it's just wet with water. And um, again, it's got heat, so you don't want to burn the gauze, so you make sure it's wet. And then you place it, the tip, in the periodontal pocket. There's a foot pedal that you're going to step on. You're going to see a different light shine on the machine saying that it is uh, being used, but you're just going to fulcrum like you do any other instrument. You're using light, smooth, overlapping strokes, similar to how you're using the ultrasonic scaler, but you're not touching the tooth surface. You're just waving it in there. And you wipe away any debris off the tip when you bring it out and wipe it with a moistened gauze. So, and after the procedure is done, you uh, take it out, you cleave, you chop off that used part. Again, you wipe the fiber down with Virex and then it can uh, be stored in the machine by retracting it into the machine. So some states allow curatage and some don't. Right now, curatage is not considered um, the number one go-to for treatment of gingivitis. Um, California still um, 
allows curatage. It used to be standard operating procedure, but it's done with uh, the use of a high powered initiated tip, right? When you're using it for laser, an initiated tip, it's cutting. And uh, this is different from other uses. So a uh, selective removal of infective ep epithelium and bacterial pathogens is done. So you're actually cutting away that necrotic granular um, gingiva. How is that different from traditional curatage? Well, with traditional curatage, you're taking a curette, a universal curette or a Gracie curette, and you're opening up the blade. So for a Gracie, you're using the wrong end. So the cutting edge is towards the gingiva and not towards the tooth. And so you're turning it around, you're pressing your thumb or your finger against the tissue, and you're literally um, scaling the lining of the tissue. So each time we scale, even though we're scaling properly, there's always a little bit of curatage happening. And that's um, whenever we go subgingively and that's coincidental or unintentional curatage. But there is a process where you want that diseased tissue removed and uh, allow everything to heal. And that is what laser curatage can do. Again, there's very little bleeding with that. Whitening procedures, zoom whitening for dental offices. That purple light, okay, is part of uh, a laser type wavelength. But you can see that safety glasses and cheek ret retractors are being used as well. Um, you'll see a painted on rubber dam on the right hand side, that blue around the gingiva, okay, because you don't want any of that whitening gel, the peroxide gel, to come in contact with the tissue. It will burn the tissue, okay? So that is the painted on rubber dam. Other lasers can um, be used with different tips. Now look at the one, this is for uh, temporomandibular uh, dysfunction. Here, this um, is for desensitizing the TMJ area. I've heard from colleagues that it's very effective. I've never seen this used uh, firsthand. It can also be used in surgery to aid in discomfort and uh, the time needed for certain chair side procedures. So we're wrapping things up. Einstein, everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will spend its whole life believing it is stupid. So um, Albert Einstein published a comment on laser beams illuminating in the fog over 100 years ago. 100 years ago, people couldn't follow his comment. His teacher told him he was dumb. We are now using the technology he was talking about. This is a great quote. So for better understanding of our topic today, you should really explore your peer reviewed studies, go and, and ask questions, read up on it. This is a technology that is not going to go away. Not much is written in our books, even the newest books just for perio might even have a paragraph on it. Uh, if that. So um, you have to be your advocate and educate yourself. So this is a time uh, where you want to question, what else can this be used for? When you get into the lab session, you will have an opportunity to uh, put this to work. And I've got the resources here. I thank you for your time.